get rolling. Um, so I'm going to call the meeting to order. Uh, first thing we have to do is approve the agenda. So take a motion to approve the agenda. Everyone's ready? I'll move the approval of the agenda. Okay, motion from Ariane. Do we have a second? I saw Maria's hand, so we'll take that as a second. <laughs> a second. Um, and so those in favor of approving the agenda say aye. 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 Any opposed? Looks like Aaron's stuck at work. Makes me sad. I mean, so is Mike, it's, but that's every it's just, time. It's just as comfortable as my basement, so, you know. <laughs> All right. Okay, so agenda approved. Um, comments from the chair. I do have a few things. Um, first off, I'm going to miss our next meeting. I'm going to be on vacation. Um, so hopefully, Gabe, you'll be available to lead things for us. Sure, I'll be here. Great. Um, do, uh, so I think one related question with that is, does anyone else expect to be out? It's uh, going to be gone too, I realize. Yeah, it's it's the local school's vacation week. So anybody else? Okay. So should, we, like should we send a poll around just in case we have an issue with a quorum? <laughs> Um, well, it seems like it seems like so we're down two. That leaves us with five. So, Brian, welcome to the meeting. We're going to grill Sorry, you. Guys. Sorry. Um, do you will you be available for the next meeting, Brian, or do you have plans with the school vacation? Yeah, I, I will be away. Um, so, what is that March? That's March seventh, right? Or March fourteenth? Okay. So, anybody else? If there's like one more person, then we may as well call it. But um, I'll send a poll around then since we don't have John's answer at the moment. Um, and uh, I mean, is that would that be problematic, Mike, for us to cancel the meeting when we're not? No, you in... can cancel it in advance. If you don't think you're going to have a quorum, you could just go and cancel the 27th meeting. And we can we can do that outside of this meeting yeah yeah that can okay. that can happen at this meeting or any time okay. up to the meeting so i think maybe maybe uh gabe i'll just let you make that call you know um you, we can always you can always have a meeting without a quorum if um if it seems like there's there's stuff to do but um i'll just leave it up to you gabe you can follow up with Aaron, Brian, and John and see if they're sure to make it. Okay. For well, we'll see what um, work we have to do too. Mike can fill us in a little bit too, so. Yeah, I think that is some missing info I don't have either is like, you know, what parts of the city plan might be available to review and so forth. Um, okay, so so that's the update. It's looking like the next meeting's questionable. Um, one uh, one thing I also wanted to bring up was that um, Maria had the idea of having a guest speaker and for um, so so what's important for me, I think if we have a guest speaker is someone who's going to really take a deep dive for us. I think that the the surface level one on one stuff's not as beneficial, but there's definitely some opportunities for some deep dive type uh, people to come in. Um, which I think can kind of expand our conversation. Um, so the things that come to mind would be having someone from CMU come and having someone from Vermont Housing Conservation Board since they focus on housing all the time. Um, so those are the two that, that we've thought of so far that would be probably good candidates. So Vermont Housing Conservation Board, we can probably figure out sometime in the future and make some contacts there. Um, but for the CNU contact, Mike, I was wondering if um, you could either reach out or just share with me the contacts you had made before when uh, when the letter was being discussed. 
Um, but in either case, just an extend an invitation for someone to drop in on our meetings about that from seeing you. So I work at the Housing and Conservation Board. Um, are you looking for, I'm just curious what you're looking for from, from a guest speaker from VHCB. Um, so I'm not remembering the name. I've personally heard um, one of the people um, there who focuses on on housing. Maybe you'll help me remember the name. Um, he he's given he's given presentations to state agencies and and other groups. Um, I could dig it up. Oh, um, is it is it Gus, our executive director? It, this wasn't the executive director, but it was uh, maybe like a. A deputy, maybe, um, of housing. I'm struggling then, to think of a man who works at HCB <laughs> who's not got to be frank. And but, and uh, then yeah. and then well, Maria made a contact with someone named Richard there. Who I was at, at my Richard was is at the Vermont Vermont Housing and Community Development Agency. Okay. Oh, yeah. oh, you know Richard. That might yeah. be the, yeah. okay. So I cross some lines. So so that's <laughs> housing community development. Yes. Um and since Maria's or, or since Ariane's confused, maybe my guy is also at community development, <laughs> not housing conservation board. In my defense, I mean same, same backgrounds, letters. They're pretty similar yeah. and they both have housing. <laughs> Oh, I would beg to differ that we're pretty yeah. similar, but that's the, the topic for the day. No, I, I meant, I meant, I meant the acronyms are similar. I did not right. mean the organizations are similar. There's an H, there's a C, there's a D. There's V's. <laughs> Just, um, okay, so so now that we have that cleared up more, but Ariane, now that you now that I accidentally said VHCB when that's probably not as relevant, that there there might be room there too. Um. But yeah, housing community. Yeah, I think I, that's. I, I think the community development area is they focus a lot more on planning, I think, than VHCB generally does. So if you want someone to talk about housing for VHCB, yeah, great. But I wasn't sure. That's partly why I was a little bit confused because we're. I don't think we're quite as planning focused as the the state. Uh, I've probably missaid VHCB fifty times then when I meant community development. So, you know. That's me learning, I guess. Good thing it's, this isn't recorded in front of TV or anything. Right. Um, <laughs> so, all Tell right. So, so, I think it is. <laughs> what? Yeah, on TV? Cool. So John's here. That's how I learned that John's here. I just embarrass myself and John appears like a, like a wizard. Um, so, uh, John, we're going to go back to something we said before. We were trying to figure out if people will be here for and available for the next meeting. So, uh, are you going to be missing because of the school break or anything like that? Because right right now, you would be the fourth person, it looks like, who would possibly be able to make the next meeting. That's on the 27th. Yeah, unfortunately, I will be in Pittsburgh at a... Well, there you go. I think uh, I think that's enough, Kirby. All righty. Yeah, just leaving it to be Gabe's call. That sounds like he made the call. So no meeting, no meeting next time. Um, and for speakers, we have got some ideas. So keep that in mind. Let's try to reach out to Congress for New Urbanism. Um, let's definitely not reach out to DHCB. And the other thing I had was um, just uh, to remind everyone, to encourage everyone to to read that review. I sent an email early, like a little earlier, a few couple hours ago, um, which is that's that's the guide that ACCD and Congress New Urbanism and a few other uh, entities worked on um, relating to planning in and in, in it's Vermont focused. Um, and I think it's I think it's a fabulous document. I'm really glad that the that that was published. So we should definitely check that out. And that's kind of the like deep dive and also kind of the I don't know if progressive planning is the right way to put it, but there's the like where planning is these days kind of approach. Um, 
you know, in that document. So I think that's a real, that's a really good one. It's really good. And it's really good for us to spread and make aware in Montpelier that, um, very traditional, you know, zoning is not where things really are right now. Um, as far as like, you know, with the, the, the in the scholarly area anyway. So, so everybody check that out. It's a great resource to know about. Um, that's, that's all I've got for comments. Does anybody else have any of those? Okay. Well, let's dive in. Um, last time we started to explore the idea of uh, looking at the design review district as a possible boundary for um, a test area to, uh, I don't know if test area is the right way to put it, but but as as maybe the boundary for maybe resume, removing density caps in our neighborhoods. Um, I think we also talked about possibly maybe um, being less strict with the density caps in the neighborhoods that are maybe touching that design district. Um, so that's that's what I'm recalling about where we were. Does does anybody else have important things they remember from that discussion? Okay. Uh, so let's just open up the floor. This is what this meeting is going to be all about. Is is we're gonna we're we'll tackle the density thing, then we'll then we'll try to move on to the other um, questions and knock those out. And I'm gonna try to keep a written record of of where we are with the ideas for this meeting. So with that, I hand it off to others to let's let's talk about density first. Um, what do you think of that idea? What other elements do we need to keep in mind? So I'll I'll just say, you know, I mean, it's just been over a little over a year since I joined the the board here. And the first zoning for those who are newer than that, right? The first zoning changes that I was involved with, um, we we got a few of the things through. We had a couple not through, right? We got the solar issue and a couple other things. But one, uh, we we had recommended this um change in lifting the density requirements. And Mike was, in his comments, was not supportive, <laughs> which, you know, was fine. Although I didn't, I don't think we all knew that in, in our deliberations here, but in the comments, the reason was that, you know, th they had cited in uh, this AARP new urbanism report, a need for uh, some better, design review process. And if if we had had that, that, you know, he could support it, but that we, you know, we didn't have it. So since then, a couple months ago, and I think maybe everyone but Maria was here for that, they there were, now I know there are guidelines and it's not necessarily like the rules, but we we have some really, really well done uh design review guidance. So I think, you know, my going in position, knowing that a lot of the opposition was about some of the other areas is where we have design review, can we go back to what we originally recommended? And what I remember from our conversation two weeks ago is that Mike actually was okay with that at this point. Then there was a separate conversation. So I think we need to talk about that first, Kirby, and see if we're all in agreement with that. And then you had talked about, well, do we need to walk back around it? But maybe we can talk about that afterwards and see, is there consensus that, okay, so we had this recommendation, we all moved forward with it. There was some issues with it, but now we're in a different place than we were. Can we all you know, support that in conjunction with the recommendations that we had and in discussion you know, with, with you know, amongst uh, this group and with um, our, our planning administrator that we're all on the same page with that? Yeah, that's good. Um, so, um, yeah, and Mike did respond to that a little bit last week, I think, but Mike, do you want to respond? No, I, I'm good with, it's, it's a lot easier to 
be able to assure public and and council about things within the design review district. I don't think that's going to be a big issue. Um, and I'm not I'm not sure that we don't have good enough rules, but the issue, as I said, was just coming, you know, when pushed, you know, do I think anything that was discussed as the worst case scenario would happen? No, I don't. But um, if somebody did want to push the worst case scenario, is there anything we could do about it? I'm not sure, you know, and that was that was where my concern was, was just being able to follow up on that, that maybe we needed to make sure. And unfortunately, we had tried to expand the design review district, and that wasn't successful in previous iterations. So certainly within the design review district, I don't think there's an issue. Um, some other things that the Historic Preservation Commission is working on, this would only apply to historic buildings, but demolition, they, they've got some draft demolition rules that they want to roll out when we do our update, because we're talking about getting a zoning update ready to go. They wanted to bring in some new demolition rules uh, for how to regulate the demolition of historic structures. So most of the time when people are talking about those worst case scenarios, they're talking about our already built out, already historic neighborhoods. And people are going to come in and buy up two historic buildings. They're going to tear them down. They're going to merge the lots and they're going to build a giant four-story building with flat roofs and all sorts of awful things. And this would at least knock that down to go through and say, well, you can't, you can't not, you can't demolish historic buildings. So that would be, that would be one place to kind of have more, more input on, or there, there would be more control over. So, um, but yeah, just, it's, when, it comes, when it comes to design, I'm, I'm pretty, I'm, I'm, I'm comfortable. I just think the public and the council is going to want a little bit more control to make sure that these things don't go haywire. And so I think part of our response to the worst case scenario is in most cases, that worst case scenario that's streamed up is not, it's, it's often not possible with the zoning we do have because we do have those additional restrictions. And then, uh, and then there's the financial element, which um, we need to remember to bring up this time around too, because a lot of these these worst case scenarios are they're going to tear down this like wonderful building and they're going to put up something ugly, and that makes no financial sense, you know. Um, but but that kind of didn't go opposed enough last time, I don't think, and city council maybe thought it might be true. Good, John. I was just going to say, you know, design is bad design isn't uh, isn't limited to to um, mixed use and multifamily housing. Like I'm sure we've seen some of the worst designs out there are, are big single family homes, <laughs> in which we have zero design standards for whatsoever. And they're subject to the same. um same sort of constraints as as the other types of development in terms of their size and massing. So basically what we're saying is if you're building a single family home, like go nuts, like you know, build it as 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 big and ugly as you want, but but we're not comfortable if it's like a duplexer or multifamily. We we have like different standards for those. And that's a good point. I put that I put that in the notes. And and on a similar note, um Mike, can you tell us the ways in which the the uh, de design review helps stop, um, you know, undesirable development, aesthetically undesirable development, which I think is what the the worst case scenario is all about, the aesthetics. Yeah, the we have an entire section for folks who aren't aware. Um, it's an overlay. So the design review district is an overlay district and it has, so it covers mostly the downtown historic district. And then it kind of extends over to a couple of other areas, some of which are not historic, including um, 
you know, the areas near the high school and out to national life. So those are all areas that are also in design review. Um, and so the design review has two sets of rules, one set of rules that are for the historic buildings and an, another set of rules that are for the not historic buildings, and then a set of rules that apply to both. And so um, if you're in that district and you want to make an exterior change to your building, you have to go to the design review committee. They make recommendations that are then enforced by either the zoning administrator when she issues the permit or the DRB. If it's a project that's going to the DRB, then they add it as conditions. Um, so they, they are recommendations to meet the requirements. Um, and then the DRB can always, it generally accepts them, but usually these are very cordial meetings and conversations. There are very few times where the design committee is recommending something that the property owner absolutely doesn't want to do or can't do. It does happen occasionally, but those can always be resolved at the at the DRB or at, with the zoning administrator. So um, so the rules have been worked on and revised in 2020 or 2021. We went through um, a major update of them. We have had design review since 1976. And so for the first 45 years, it pretty much had the same six standards. It was just six lines with no, no guidance, just six lines. Um, and so it was a, a pretty, you know, pretty much the opinion of the DRC. Um, and now it's a much more, uh, has much more detail in it. So it's a little less arbitrary, um, which was one of the complaints of the old one was people would complain that it was an arbitrary set of rules because you could go to the DRC one year and you'd get one decision and go to a DRC two years later and get a different decision simply because some people had left. So the new rules are a little bit more refined, but they're, um, they're doing a very, they're, they seem to be doing a very good job. And I think it's evidenced by looking at the downtown. Um, and I just did a review of the historic uh, register and some of these things and the number of historic buildings and the number of buildings that have changed significantly in our downtown is pretty it's pretty minimal. Um, most of the changes have um, supported the historic preservation. Um, they're good buildings, good recommendations. Um, so I think in general, if you were to look over the, the, the lifetime of the design review district, it's been pretty successful in accomplishing what it wants to do, which is out of town, out of state developers haven't come in, bought up buildings, bulldozed them and put in, you know, put in a Rite Aid or put in a Kinney's or something that you just don't see that in our downtown, which you will in other communities. So I guess I have, well, I mean, first of all, I just have to acknowledge that I think I have a different view than probably most other commissioners and that aesthetics and historic preservation is not my, <laughs> not my top priority. Um, and I especially, I always think about working in housing, the operational costs of historic buildings can be really, really difficult. Um, but my question is, so if we would expand um, to have more density outside of the design review district, I mean, we do have, I'm not clear on what, I guess, protections you're, I mean, I'm not maybe as worried about them, but if other people are, like, what are the protections or for historic buildings or what, I mean, there's still design standards, right? They're just not design in the design review district. So there aren't design standards. So if you were, um, let's, let's say you're up part way up on East state. So you're in the national register historic district. You have a, um, um, you have a historic house. You're not in design review. You could go out and, uh, you know, take the windows out and board up all the windows and put on vinyl siding over the whole thing. You, there's no design requirements at all on an existing house that's outside that. If you want to build a brand new building, we do have some architectural standards you have to meet. Um, but if you don't, if whatever you're doing is just working with an existing building, then there are no protections or requirements that go with that house or that property. 
um, those standards only apply within the design review district. And anywhere in the town, if you're building a new building, um, other than single and two family. So single and two family do not have to go through any architectural standards because it's the architectural rules are embedded in site plan. And so site plan requirements only apply to not single and two family. So uh, if you're going to build a brand new triplex or quadplex, um, you bought a vacant piece of land, you're going to have some architectural requirements that you need to meet. Okay, but you could still put I mean, you could put vinyl siding on those buildings today, right? You just couldn't make them more dense. Uh, on a historic building outside of the historic district? Yeah, outside of the design review district. Yeah, outside of design review district, you could remove the clapboards and put on vinyl siding if you want. If you're in the historic district and it's a historic building, you would not be allowed to remove wood clapboards and put on vinyl siding. You, you have to replace with like material. Yeah, but I guess what I'm getting at is I don't quite see the connection between density and, you know, the putting vinyl siding on a house, I guess that's just my yeah, question. The, the, cons the concern is, that, I mean, those those are some of the small things that design review looks at, but design review also looks at big things and not, and, and, the demolition you're really difficult to demolish a historic building in the historic district it's it's a very difficult process to do through design review and through drb it's an easier process outside of design review um but it's that and what the concern was that were that were raised by the public and you know when we get 25 30 people in here talking about how no density is going to destroy our neighborhood the argument that is always brought out is either demolishing one house or buying two houses that are next to each other, bulldozing the houses and putting in, you know, the 22 units in a square box with a flat roof and parking in the backyard. And there's, you know, and that's, you know, out of character with all of the neighborhood. Can and we have so, a design competition to see who could come up with the worst design and if any bank would finance it? <laughs> <laughs> uh, I mean, it's usually the economics that we just can't get. I mean, if you if you buy two buildings on Loomis or Liberty Street, you're talking about spending more than like $1.5 million to buy two houses nowadays. And if you're going to demolish those buildings, you're spending another, you know, you're $2 million and you haven't even put in a foundation. So, um, you know, the reality of you being able to make any money on a building afterwards would be pretty slim. Your best bet is to keep the building as it is and renovate it and, and maximize your profit within the existing, you know, maybe maybe renovate or put in uh, an accessory or a carriage house or something like that that would generate a little bit more income. But you're usually not going to demolish the house. But the argument that's always made is someone can demolish the, the buildings. I have a question about um, the effects of eliminating the density requirements in the downtown. When did that happen? Do you guys know? I I can't ex say exactly when. I would have to do a little bit of homework on it. But I think that I don't think there's been density in the downtown for a very long time. You know, it may like five or six 20. years. I know, like what's like twenty years? Is it oh. I, at least it was in, okay. it was at least more than 20 years. Okay. Um, I, how, so, how far back? I don't know. I mean, we've, the, the city of Montpelier, st stupid hit, trivia fact, uh, we had zoning since 1947. So okay. we've had zoning for a very long time. How long density has been in effect in the downtown? I don't, I don't know for sure whether it was in the 47 zoning. There was a major revision in 73 and then another major revision in about 86, 87. So okay. um, at some point that went into effect. Okay. I'm just, I'm wondering if, you know, eliminating the density limit requirement, um, would it even have the effect that I think most of us would want, you know, of creating more housing or... 
are there other requirements and hurdles that people need to jump through that would eliminate that additional housing in its place? You know, it's not like downtown. It hasn't had a density, this density limit hasn't been there in 30 years. And yet we still have open lots and, um, I don't know. I'm just wondering if density is really the one thing that we should be focusing on. Kirby, you're shaking your head. Yeah, no, I mean, no, no, there is there is no silver bullet. There is no one yeah. thing. This we, is this is tearing down one of several barriers. Right. I think but it's also like it's just, it seems like it's a very controversial barrier. You know, I wonder if there are other ways to accomplish what we want. Yeah, I think we had, we had this exact discussion last time and it's a it's a very good good point we were wondering like well what what are we there are plenty of places where you can develop now we've had places with that that density and i think where we landed was like it may help a few like edge cases where maybe they've been prevented from adding one or two units um it would likely be a handful um, of housing units. And that was like worth it for us. If we can get a few more homes, great. But given the, the amount of, you know, political capital or, or the amount of like, or I guess it is questionable or debatable if this is like, well, if we're, if we're gonna, you know, exhaust ourselves and, and spend a lot of time and, and effort, and it's going to be, we're going to end up with a handful of other units when maybe there's there's something else we could do that would be more beneficial then maybe that our time and resources would be better so that i just don't know what it is and it does feel like we need it needs to, from my perspective it needs to be like everything we need to like try to remove as, as many of these barriers as possible you know i think some of the other um suggestions that was that were in that report like all together so this is not the silver bullet, right? It's just one piece. But, you know, I hope we had a chance to talk about, you know, they, they ask, why can't we do uh, conversion at three and four units the same way we do duplexes, right? I mean, I think that's a very good question. So if, if you've removed the density requirement and then we make it easier to convert to three to four bedrooms and say, look, that's a very acceptable use. Um, and that can be done just through zoning, for example, right? There's just, there's, multiple things that they recommend and that's this is just one of them so i agree it's not the only thing but i think in tandem with some of these other things it could be important and i yeah there's a couple there's a couple of i think interesting points though respond maria um one is i i think that the density thing is a foundational thing that it's hard to make much improvement in other areas if we're continuing to have like basing everything around density which is it's just not the right way to go about it. It's just like fundamentally flawed way. And so getting off of that, I think is important for a academic person purpose, other than just how many houses can we get? That's one part of it. Another part of it is um, a, an anecdotally, I think in our hearings, people really zero in and focus on density and respond badly when we have other ideas like that aren't even necessarily density focused. Like when we redid the zoning, people really just honed in on for every neighborhood, what's the density instead of looking at the other aspects of the zoning. And so I think it's getting in the way of, of helpful conversations as well. So there's like a lot of these like side fringe benefits. And then another thing that occurs to me is that, um, shoot, I knew I was going to lose it, lose um, it. The, um, I'll, I'll see the floor for a second. That'll come back to me in a minute. Well, you know, I, um, and I emailed, I think Mike, it was you and, and Kirby about this, but you were talking at one point, like what you were saying, Gabe, about, you know, turning a big house that has maybe one apartment into a, into three or four apartments, like a big house. You were saying, uh, Mike, you had mentioned the big houses on Bailey, for example, like, you know, I don't know if that's the worst case scenario that one of those big houses becomes three units, right? Um, but what are the barriers? Like, I was like, well, what's, I know every project's has its own particularities but i mean i would and i've called the the town about some stuff on my property but i mean and, and there's always these challenges like oh well this specific project would need this and need that but i mean what are the barriers to changing 
one of the big houses on Bailey from either a single family home or one with a, you know, an attic apartment to have three units right now, what would those barriers be? Like an example, because it's, it's a, I mean, I'm, I'm not, I'm not dumb, but like it gets complicated pretty quick when you start talking about the different like lot coverage versus this versus that. And if you were to call like any given time, I'm not saying, you know, the staff is going to tell you there's going to be particular levels of review based on whatever impacts you're going to have on your right from your project. So some of it may be just administrative. Some of it might go to the DRB. I realize that's all gets complicated, but I, I guess I was just looking for kind of an example of what the barriers are right now. Um, so the the first barrier you might find is we would look at your property and you're in res 6,000. Yeah. So that means you need to have 6,000 square foot lot to have a conforming lot. And you can have one unit for every 6,000 square feet. That's the density requirement we're talking about. Um, but uh, you can, regardless of density, you can have a duplex. So let's say just... For example, you have an 11,000 square foot lot. So it's uh, quite a bit bigger than the minimum and not, but not quite enough to be double. Um, so you have 11,000 square feet, you can still have a duplex. So you come in and say, boy, you know, uh, I'd like yeah. to have an extra, I'd like to have a third unit. You just can't do it. That's where, that's where there's a barrier. And that's, you know, getting to Maria's question, you know, and, and John's comment that, you know, it's kind of these ones that are certain certain ones that are on the edge uh we changed the zoning on harrison was it over over um by main street there and we went from res 6000 to res 3000 so that way it would match liberty in in loomis in those and one of the reasons we made that change was because there was somebody who had a house and he had already had an accessory apartment in his uh second floor and he had a garage and he wanted to convert that garage into another accessory apartment. And we said, well, you can't have two accessory apartments and you don't have the density to support that um, because your lot isn't big enough. So by changing it from res 6,000 to res 3,000, he would have enough density in order to support the two units he already has plus adding in a third one. So it was just enough to kind of add a little bit and it got a lot of support from the public uh, in, in that neighborhood. They were like, Oh, that's okay. Because we're already finding, you know, most of our neighborhoods are kind of similar to those. And so that change went through really without much opposition, but there are a lot of people that do end up having some issues. Um, some neighborhoods do have issues and we, we had, we had to, we've had some of these very contentious meetings about making a zoning change, but that's usually where it is. It's just enough to make a small change. Yeah. Um, and then the other things for Brian, you know, once you get past that density, maybe you do have enough. Um, and actually, you know, even, you know, taking your res 6,000 example, let's say you had a 17,000 square foot lot. You still couldn't go to the triplex because you need 18,000 in your, in your lot. So you've got a 6,000 square foot minimum. You have a 17,000 square foot lot, but you're not allowed to put another apartment in over the garage. Um, and that's really, those are the examples that come up from time to time. We don't get a lot of these that we have to turn down, um, uh, giving a little bit of history back before our change in 2018, we had a lot of non-conforming lots and there was no duplex requirements. So you, you pretty much had very little infill potential in the city. It was a big change to get us to those, what we called the 90% rule. So we made 90% of all the lots, 90% of all the uses conforming, um, which helped to give some infill potential, but there's still a lot of buildings that are, that are maxed out. Um, mm -hmm. And the density is that requirement. Most of the other requirements are more dimensional and they talk about building new things, height, setbacks, building footprints. So that's um, those usually don't end up stopping a project. Uh, they, they can, in certain cases, if you have a really small lot with a lot of pavement, a lot of roofs, you might already be over. And if you needed to make any additions, you, you might be in trouble trying to fit something in. But for the most part, 
if there's something that's blocking it, it's probably the density requirement. Uh, it's probably because you already have a duplex and your lot isn't three times the size. Right. Um, that would be the big one. We also have this silly shadow rule. Right. You guys mentioned that before. Yeah. Oh, the shading yeah, rule. We're gonna, yeah. We're, yeah, we're going to get to that, uh, John, after we finish the CNU stuff, by the way. It's not, it's not forgotten. Uh, the thing, I, the thing that I uh, forgot earlier was uh, the political capital point, and that's that um, a lot of the folks are going to be opposing this. It, I don't think it's a matter of political capital because if it's not density, it's they'll they'll be opposing something else. You know what I mean? Um, it's not like a path of least resistance. There's going to be so, like a decent amount of resistance. Um, for any changes to try to open up the city for housing. So um, that, was, that was the thing. Um, okay, I've, um, I've heard a lot of good stuff here um, about the, this particular uh, project uh, or this, you know, that's at hand for us here. Um, are there other aspects of it that we want to include in a recommendation? Um, for instance, um, the question will come up, should we do any amendments to the design review regulations in light of this? So that's something we should probably at least consider because it's going to come up. Um, and also the idea that there's going to be a density cliff that's, you know, with the neighborhoods that are right outside. Um, the design review district. Do we do anything with those densities? So those those are two things I'm, I'm going to put on the table. Um, we can handle the first one first. Like Mike, um, I think you've you've addressed this in a way earlier. But um, what are your thoughts about the need to go back and consider making any changes to the design review regulations? If there are any changes to the regulations, we're just going to be talking about increasing the where it applies to. I would think. I mean, the the dent the rules themselves, the design review rules themselves are good. Um, okay. Uh, the the only other thing we could look at would be the um, the architectural standards that are embedded in the um, major site plan rules, but. I mean, that will certainly help with a number of projects. Um, certainly, if somebody were to figure out how to tear down and build new and wanted to build something really ugly, you know, how much, you know, how good are those rules? You know, that that's that's an open question. We really haven't had a lot of projects that had to go through design review for, for um, or to have new projects outside of design review that had to use the architectural standards. Um, we had a couple, we've had a couple, but not, not a lot of them. And the projects have generally been good. So I don't think it's a, don't think it's an issue, but we also haven't had people who tried to abuse the system. And, you know, I've lived in communities where people have, you know, wanted to fit it in, you know, do, do whatever they wanted to and kind of, make it make it meet the rules but it's really not meeting the spirit of the rules so that would be but i think within within the design review those rules are fine those rules are fine um and unless we want to entertain expanding the the district um i would point out just you know we want to talk about politics and public perception, um, the VCFA, and if anybody's been following the press and anyone's been following anything, VCFA is looking at trying to put in a campus PUD and it's been getting um, a lot of public input, public comment. VCFA is also in the design review district. So if we had a conversation that said we're going to remove density in the design review district, it would be removing also removing density from VCFA, which... We will certainly um, 
you 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 making the recommendation would just have to be aware that there's going to be um certainly public comment on that from that area but but mike isn't a planned unit it, that would be a planned unit development right so isn't that just proactively an overlay and you could control the uses within that the, the, the issue right now is not well I'm not, I'm not telling you you know all this what, but i mean i'm just saying like isn't the issue that people don't want to proactively I use the word proactively. They don't want to give them permission on the front end on the variety of uses. They want to have it, they being people around there, want to have it throughout the process. They don't, like a PUD just helps you tee up the uses and then everyone has an idea, right, of what can go in there within reason. And there's still site plan review, but they don't want to give, uh, neighbors don't want to give up any of that, right? They don't want, so it, it, you could you could have a different density requirement. It doesn't have to be no density within a PUD, right? You could say, if if the if the develop or whoever agreed to it, you could have a different density requirement within a PUD, right? Yes, except that um, if if the proposal that we're you know that. Kirby's kind of put on the table here and say, all right, what happens if we decided we wanted to propose no density within the design review district? Now, some of it already is that way. In the urban center one, two, and three already don't have density requirements. And so nothing changes with that. But there are a couple of places where it would make an impact. Um, and I think, you know, we pointed out, um, you know, national life over near Redstone. Right. Um, yeah. Uh, to start a terrace street uh, and VCFA, and so VCFA so will also be a beneficiary of that of that change. Let's let's go to Kirby's question before and just speak specifically to that. How does the current design review process protect the character of the neighborhood up around the college? So I, it is all mostly historic. So I trying to avoid getting too much into the because you know every, both sides all sides work uh work for me uh not just commenting generally on the rules and some of the application pieces i'm i'm not i'm not in depth on what the applications are i know generally what what the details are um so the the change of the density um, again, we're talking about dwelling units, the number of dwelling units. Um, it could allow more or less. Some of what the application is looking at is changing some of the uses. So in the PUD rules, it says you can take some conditional uses and make them permitted uses. And so they want pre-approval for a couple of uses. They have a list of uses, um, one of which is to make multifamily development, not a conditional use, but a permitted use. Um, and so the design review rules means they can't make any changes to the exterior of the buildings, but what happens on the interior of the buildings? Um, what, you know, how many units could you fit into one of those, you know, let's say you take one of the old dormitory buildings, uh, you could put in a number of 20 unit, uh, you know, of, of two bedroom apartments, three bedroom apartments, or you could put studios um, or single room occupancies. Um, you could do SROs and end up with a lot. That's where the density is going to come in because we're counting the number of dwelling units, not the number of bedrooms. Um, and so they could be restricted. I don't know. It's a pretty high density and they've got pretty big acreage, but if they were to sell some of these parcels off, when you sell the parcels off, the parcels end up smaller. So what you might look at is, oh, the VCFA campus is pretty big. They've got a lot of potential development. But once you subdivide, you might find that that dormitory is sitting on a small piece of land and therefore couldn't be fully. Re but the density, again, it just so so lifting the density, if I understand what you just said, right, the the design review doesn't have anything to do with uses, right? It's got nothing. It just has to do with what the the character of the neighborhood is. And and basically, it does what we're hoping to do, which is to increase the amount of housing that we could have. Is that what I just heard? Yeah. So I yeah. I don't think 
personally, there would be an issue. The issue is that political capital or that that public capital that's going to come in because just bec because it's including VCFA, there's going to be a lot of pushback simply because it's VCFA and the folks are going to want to have as much control and not seed control. That, that's been the general sentiment of the public opinion so far. So just telegraphing and maybe I'm, you know, maybe I'm wrong. But uh, just trying to look down the road is kind of like when when you see Saban's Pasture Project, you can kind of go through and say, you know, well, we're going to change the zoning in Saban's Pasture. You're going to automatically guarantee you're going to get public comment. Um, we're not at this time looking to change that. So if anyone is looking online or watching this on television, we are not looking at changing the Saban's Pasture zoning. Um, <laughs> but the that's the general um you know, sense that I just wanted everybody to be aware of that it is in design review. It's been a hotly contested PUD application so far coming in in two months to go through and say, hey, we're going to take the the density out of that area. You're probably going to, you should, you should just be aware of that before that. Decision. Right. I think my initial response to that is, I mean, maybe, maybe what we're trying to do here could be really helpful because we'll answer some of those contentious questions. Um, and I also think that this could be a really good example for us to show why density is not helpful, because um, if the controversy is around the worst case scenario of one of the buildings on the VCFA campus being turned into apartments that house a lot of people, tell me the downside to that. Um, you know. So. Yeah, that is my neighborhood, and I would say bring it. <laughs> I miss I miss having the students around. I kind of want that area to be lived in and enjoyed. It's kind of sad that it's sitting empty. So, like, just not to get too far afield here, but like the idea of a like some kind of overlay district that that doesn't exist necessarily in the zoning. For for example, you 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 know a developer would come in and say, "I'm going to pass a zoning overlay district just for this area, and we're going to all negotiate what uses between the town, between the city and the applicant." There would be a public discussion about what uses would be included in there, but then once it's together, it'd be memorialized as its own little, you know what I mean? Well, you know what I mean. You're, you're a planner, it's, you know. Uh, it's, that, is, <laughs> that is one way to do it, and that's a little bit of what we have right now. Um, and I think we're all, we all should have a conversation, and I, and I think Gabe was thinking about this before when, when he had emailed me on a previous piece. Um, within our PUDs, we have those rules that allow the changing of the, the zoning and we should sit down and have a conversation of whether we want to continue to allow that as an option. And, you know, that maybe it's a good thing, maybe, maybe it's not. The initial reason why this all came about was, again, you know, 2018, pre-2018, the zoning that was in effect, the college campus was HDR, high-density uh, residential. And... Uh, as HDR, everything that the college did was non-conforming. Offices, um, being a school, uh, you know, all, all the uses, um, you know, the, the accessory, retail, the cafeterias, everything was all non-conforming. So they had what was called an AI PUD, and it was, they had to do a master plan. That was all stuff that was in there that let them kind of work their way back in. When we were doing the zoning update, we were negotiating with the college to try to come up with some good new rules because that that system really wasn't working well. And what we came up with, actually, we ended up doing both things and they both passed. So one was to rezone that area to MUR, mixed use residential, which made most of their uses either permitted and conditional. And then we also had the campus PUD, which would allow them to have additional flexibility on top of that. The question is because they ended up with both, because we weren't sure at the end, you're kind of doing two things at two different times. And at the end, when everything was passed, they ended up with two ways to do it. They could 
just operate their college without any campus PUD. But they also had rules for a campus PUD. So, um, and, and there is benefits to having that. But one of the questions is, should we have allowed that much flexibility in the uses? And that's a conversation we can have down the road. We can prepare a little bit of a presentation on that. But for the here and now, when we're talking about density, uh, that's some of the question that we've really kind of got to tackle is, all right, we can adjust adjust some things. Um, but so in terms of what the pushback, like political, we're talking about political will, or you know what is what's possible, whether it makes sense or not, what's what's actually possible. The thing people care about, right? The people that are freaked out about zone, uh, density are the worst case scenario. You bulldoze it, you build an ugly multifamily building. Some people are freaked out because you're adding another unit to your six thousand square foot lot, right? You can add a third unit, let's say, uh, tack it on. So. And then there's the idea that there could be particular areas of town like the campus or off terrace or other places where it could be, I mean, either that's a good thing or a bad thing. It's all just concentrated in those areas. So, I mean, I was thinking of in terms of if there's only marginal, not marginal, but you guys are saying outlier benefit, like maybe you get a handful, we'll take all we can get in terms of extra units to get rid of density. But the idea of identifying specific areas of town that are designated for more intense housing units, uh, housing uses, that's not probably any more politically palatable than getting rid of density. Certainly not for the people that live near there. Right? Yeah, probably. Yeah, and I think some of it's just balancing the, the historic character of so many of the neighborhoods. Um, yeah. And I think that's that's a lot of it. You know, do you know how much of a density requirement do we need for you know country club and you know some of these areas that aren't built out and don't have a historic character? You know, if you want to build on River Street out on Route 302, you know, how much density should we have out there? You know, yeah. I don't know if we really care. I mean, you know, is it gonna offend tractor supply to have a you know a three-story 40 unit? building out there? Uh, I don't think so. You know, assuming you've got enough parking for the 40 parking spaces, I don't think anyone would care out there. But I'd have to think that that would, that's in my view, <laughs> as somebody who's worked in transportation, that is such a, a poor use of resources to have a 30 unit building next to tractor supply. We want our downtowns to house people and we want the we, we, that's where we want our density i would think um i think that's what makes montpelier a vibrant city is having a dense downtown if we are going to insist on having zoning rules that incur that instead of encouraging building within the city limits it would encourage developers otherwise to go to you know, out the tractor supply and build a 30 unit condo. That's just, I would think that's not what we want. You know, that's not the kind of development that we want to see. Um, I don't know. <laughs> Does everyone else agree with me? I just kind of like, I would, I would think that would be bad <laughs> for the hey, environment. Hey, but it's more housing. It's more housing and it'd probably be cheaper than the stuff you'd buy in Montpelier down, near downtown. So it is a tricky, it is a tricky about more housing or not, right? Yeah. Sorry, a little bit. So yeah, sorry, I think I interrupted you. No, no, no. Um I think I think that location is a tricky one. You know, on one hand, it is more housing. On the hand, it's maybe like on the fringe of what is, you know, walkable. On the other hand, maybe you have access to public transit. It's also it's also a corridor where we want you know, limited access, and it is not one where we want high trip generation and to add add congestion of all the of all the streets in Montpelier. You know, that is one where we want um, we want to prioritize sort of mobility over uh, place making. You know? So anyway, I think it, that one's like a good tr com complicated or trickier trickier example. 
I think Maria is hitting on what our experience has been on the planning commission the last few years. I mean, I mean, the, the gist of what she's saying is kind of what we're always dealing with. Someone else was going to say something. Well, I was going to ask Mike. So I think, you know, I, just going through the report again, a couple other things that popped out to me. So for looking in this area where we have uh, design review and it's, you know, it's more walkable, right? And maybe we don't need vehicles and parking and things like that. Um, there are a couple other suggestions in there. And I don't know, Mike, that I, I think we talked about it like the first time we brought this back up, maybe a month and a half or two months ago. But I don't know that I really understand where we're at. They're, they they have some recommendations in here about basically making a, up to a fourplex like very easy. Maybe not even if I'm reading this right, not even requiring a permit, right? Just as a matter of right, um, that you can you can carve up, you know, these buildings. So I don't know that I don't know that I heard your opinion on that that particular. I think you said something, but I, I guess I don't understand it. So. Could we talk about that for a second? Because I think, you know, if we're looking at, again, the, the Bailey Street or any of these other ver very large homes, um, you know, that's part of the issue is, you know, 4,000 square feet. I mean, there's there's a lot of people that could benefit. And as you've said, 60 to 70 percent of the demand is for efficiency, one bedroom type units. Right. So. So uh, my. One of my concerns about that recommendation was the not not wanting, you know, basically have it a buy right. You don't even need to come in and get a permit. And the reason why I have issues with that is because we have a lot of requirements. And for the most part, you know, we can require a minimal permit for folks and it'll cost them $35 or $50. And they can get a permit in two to three days. Um, and that's not a uh, oversized burden to make sure that they meet the requirements that are in zoning. Um, cause otherwise people can do whatever. If you say you don't need a permit, then they don't have to meet setbacks and they don't have to meet height requirements. And they don't have to meet anything. And if you say, well, you don't have to get a permit provided you meet all the zoning requirements, then I can tell you for, for a fact that most people are overwhelmingly, most people are not going to be able to read the zoning and understand whether or not they've met all the zoning requirements, which means I'm going to end up going out and enforcing the zoning, administering the zoning through the enforcement wing by issuing notices of violation because you built it without it. So the recommendation to say no permits um, is what we should be doing, I think is just a bad way to go. We now- All right, so that was the say furthest- that we can't make it easier or to go through and yeah. say, they're all permitted uses, which they are in every zoning district in the city. It is a permitted use. You never have to go to the DRB for a conditional use approval for up to four units. Um, we could make the same recommendation we did for duplexes and go through and say, um, everything up to four units, as long as you have a conforming lot, you can do up to four units. Um, right now we're saying up to, up to a duplex, up to two units, you could say three units, or you could say four units. So regardless of density, you can do up to a quadplex. You still have to get a permit and we can make sure that you meet all of the requirements of the permit. Um, it's just, it's just a change. So that, that's what my concerns were with that recommendation is they seem to be making, the permit process, the bad guy in this one, and the fact that it could be appealed. Well, if if we don't have permits, then people can't, neighbors can't appeal it. Well, either we're not going to have zoning at all, in which case, great, you people can do whatever the heck they want, and you know that that probably won't work out for the best. Um, or um, they have to meet the zoning, but they don't need to get a permit, in which case we're doing the enforcement or their neighbors are still going to have the right to appeal. Um, so it's well, so it's there were there were up. two recommendations, right? One was what you said at the end, which was basically make it you, you get a, you apply for a permit. Then they went further and said, why even do that? Right. So, OK, so it sounds like they're, you, you know, as a professional zoning administrator, you feel like you know, that our planner, right? That there's value to having a permit process, but we could potentially go to up to four units with permit. 
Yeah. And it's definitely, um, you know, p- people generally up front think they won't like the fact that they have to get a permit, but it actually works out in your favor because we, we've we done all the review. When we issue you a permit, you know, you, you know, you meet all the rules and you don't have to worry about um, something down the line um, as opposed to, you know, as you said, just tell, let people do what they want with this, adopt the zoning. And if you break the rules, then we'll, then we'll go and talk to you and you can go back and retrofit it. Well, that can be difficult if your building doesn't meet setbacks um, because that would be really expensive to try to move the building or tear it down. So it would seem like investing. if you were building a four unit, if you're adding four units, having a piece of paper that says you're good to go would be a nice thing, right? And if it's, we can make it so that it's like free and you get it within two days. So like it's, shouldn't be too, too onerous, but yeah. Yeah, if it's in design review, it'll take a couple of weeks. If there's going to be an exterior change, um, that could take up to, you know, we uh, DRB meets uh, every other week. So it could take as much as 15 to maybe 20 days at the most. But usually if you're building a project that big, you probably are, you know, not looking at just deciding on a whim to start building tomorrow. You're usually going to have some time. So, um, but we are very prompt about issuing uh, issuing permits we've got a, a very quick efficient process here in the city so um, that's my own education i'm just how do you appeal if there's no permit there wouldn't technically be a, uh, you appeal your decision not to issue a notice of violation <laughs> yes that is it we are we are we are required under law to enforce all violations and therefore if somebody makes a violation and usually what'll happen is the neighbor is going to be the one who comes in and says that was built you know 7 feet from the property line the requirement was 10 and then if we don't do it then they can appeal it to court to force us to but if they don't violate any of the other rules they could still appeal and have that process but it wouldn't necessarily go anywhere i'm just cur- again just trying to understand yes. okay because we it, and that doesn't change things right now. We we get appeals right now from people. We'll make decisions and people will appeal them because they'll find some obscure thing to obscure uh, to to appeal it. And um, you know, it's it's constitutionally people's right to redress. Uh, you know, government decisions and you know the the permit I issue to the neighbor is something you legally constitutionally have a right to appeal and. If they're gonna if they're gonna do it, they're gonna beat you up anyway. So if they don't do it that way, they'll just file a civil suit. Um. So. So the couple of things that we've thought about in our office. So we talked about this whole density piece. So one option we could do again, we keep you know cutting cutting halves into things would be to put a proposal in for either some or a number of districts, we could double the density. So we've already talked about the fact that if you own a single family lot, um, you know, um, Brian has a house in Res 6,000, he can get a duplex on that 6,000, even if he doesn't have 12,000 square feet. Um, We could double the density, which would go through and say, even though it's Res 6,000, which is the lot size, um, density is calculated at one unit per 3,000, which is basically what we're already doing for single family and duplexes anyways. And what that would do is kind of expand that window. Um, so, uh, you know, Brian has, for example, maybe an 11,000 square foot lot, he could have a triplex because now we're multiplying times three. So if you're res 6,000, the density is 3,000. If you're you know, res 3000, then your res, you know, your density is one unit per 1500. So it's not removing the density altogether, but we basically doubled the a number of infill potential lots that we could get. Um, it won't give everybody something, but it will give everybody a little bit. And if we're talking about the existing built out areas, most of the time, that's what we're talking about with our infill lots is 
you know, maybe somebody has a duplex and they've got that carriage shed that they want to put another unit in, um, those types of things. So doubling the density would be one place as a compromise that we could look at um, instead of removing density altogether. Another, this is completely different, uh, recommendation is although one, two, three, and four unit are permitted all the way throughout the city, conditional use is not. Um, uh, the multifamily is not. Multifamily, five or more units, is a conditional use in a number of districts. And so, you know, a little bit by way of education, conditional use really looks at three items traffic, um, whether it'll have an impact on municipal facilities, which in Montpelier it never does, and character of the area. So one suggestion we've been considering, you know, and we'll have you guys start to think about is maybe for conditional use, because it really could be anything from five units to 45 units, maybe we put a cutoff in there at about maybe 15 units. And I'll give you a little bit of thought on why I'm thinking about 15 units. So you'd have small multifamily, which might be permitted, large multifamily, 15 or more, that would need conditional use approval. And the reason why at 15 units is that we currently, the number one thing that's going to make an impact in there is um, traffic. And so we require a traffic study at 75 vehicles a day. So not getting into too much of the, the stuff. Um, Maria would probably know some of the, some of the average daily traffic stuff. Um, well, a, a, a dwelling unit usually is about five, I, from what I understand. So that would be, you know, if we're if you're only generating fifty new car trips a day, you don't need to do a traffic study in our current zoning. It's not trip till about seventy five, which is about fifteen units. So we could. And maybe it's not for all districts, but we could have more districts that have multifamily as a permitted use, um, up to 15 units or up to 10 units, whatever number you guys would think. Um, and it's just another suggestion that would help maybe get some projects out of conditional use review and into the permitted uses, which might make, you know, again, we're talking about a couple of projects here and there. And it's um it's just you know, like we said, it's just another, it's it's really trying to get out of the character of the area piece. Um, at what point is it really impacting the character of the area? If it meets the, if it meets the, the build to bulk and massing requirements, remember there, you, you may be talking about 12 units, but you still have to meet the building footprint requirement. You still have to meet the height requirement. You still have to meet the setback requirements, still have to have the parking. So if you meet all that, why would we say no? Um, we really don't need the extra review until we start generating enough traffic. And that would be um, at that next level. So that was, so that's, those are a couple of our thoughts. We had doubling the density, um, splitting and making small, small multifamily, large multifamily, and making more of the small multifamily as permitted uses. So those were a couple of the ideas that we had that we thought might be things you'd think about for additional changes to increase the potential of housing so we don't want traffic but we're going to require you to have a space for your car <laughs> and then if you don't you can't build here so you'll go build elsewhere and then drive into my computer <laughs> well the economics usually is especially if you're building larger things is the banks aren't going to finance without one parking space per unit anyways so that's just generally even if we didn't require the parking it would end up having to have that parking anyways Mike, were there specific districts that you were thinking of for doubling the density for? Or did you guys not, you know, when you went through this, did you identify which areas you thought that would be appropriate for? And would there be pushback on that? I'm sure there would be some pushback. Um, my best argument I could give in support of it is just the fact that we already really did it for the smallest pieces. Everyone who's got a single family home on a conforming lot can have a duplex, even if you don't have, even if you don't meet the density requirement by basically adopting that as a density requirement, um, you're just 
allowing the the units to add up a little bit faster. So um, I was thinking for most of the, uh, it wouldn't adjust for rural lands because really you have to be on sewer and water to be able to do that. Rural lands is the part that doesn't have sewer and water. Um, so it probably wouldn't apply there. Isn't, it would be, but aren't the arguments and sorry, Mike, for interrupting, but I was like, aren't the the people in the arguments against that? Isn't that going to be the same thing, whether we get rid of it or whether we double it or even a marginal increase, you know, people would vilify, vilify us and treat us like we're destroying the city. And it didn't really matter like what that number was. It was like any increase whatsoever. You, you know, I think the, the other piece of this is that we, we do have, you know, input from Congress and new urbanism and AARP. And so if we, if we could, at least in the initial, I think those are all great ideas, Mike, I like all those, but at least in our initial sort of feedback, if we stuck within the, the lines of what they, the recommendations they made, I, I feel like we've got a little bit more support, right? Because not, this isn't just, you know, we're not the only one saying this. We've got people that advise communities all over the country that feel like we could do, it's not, we're not quite form-based zoning, but we're moving more in that direction, right? Uh, I mean, we're really not moving towards form-based zoning. That's going to be one of the issues. To move towards form-based zoning would be a big shift. Um, and And I'm not sure we can do that within the same box that we have for our historic because of our historic rules it starts it starts to become much more muddled um and i and i think you know my thought on why doubling the density i mean aarp is saying remove the density and certainly we could go in and say look they want us to remove the density we recognize there's not the political will to remove the density but we could certainly go through and double the density and the reason I think a little bit getting to John's comment, I, I think that might be a little bit more palatable is just because we can point to the fact that we've we allow the duplexes in every conforming lot and 90% of the lots are conforming. And the sky didn't fall. Um, yes, those same opponents are going to be coming in and saying the sky is going to fall. But we already made a big change like this and the sky didn't fall. So adding just a little bit more to allow maybe a few more triplexes and maybe a few more quadplexes, because again, they're still density limited. So, you know, in the, in the, in the Brian example, so he's got a, you know, 11,000 square foot lot and now he can have three units. Okay. I mean, that's probably not that, you know, going to have that big of an impact on on the neighborhood to go, even if he went from single family to, to triplex. And if he's got four or five times the, the property size. Um, We're talking about the recommendations of the AARP here. This isn't some kind of like radical, like organization. <laughs> like. Um, actually, I'm going to, I'm going to jump in just to do some, you know, uh, facilitating stuff over our conversation. I didn't want to interrupt because that was all wonderful. Um, we talked about density, which is a big part of their first recommendation. They made three recommendations. It would be beneficial for us to leave this meeting having some sort of framework for all three of their things about what we want to do. And I'll tell you right now what I'm thinking about what we should do is I'm putting this document together, this sort of a living document thing based on this discussion. Um, I would say over the next, it, you know, it's gonna be a month before we meet again. So over the next month, I would invite everybody to get into that document and leave notes and comments about um, where to go and the different things that I have highlighted. Um, definitely not gonna have captured everything from this discussion. And after we kind of have that, get ready to vote a month from now on some recommendations that we want for our response for the AARP and, and CNU. Um, and then from there, we'll move on and to shading and some other things that we would want to include in the same bundle of recommendations for city council. So for now though, let's make sure the way that we've addressed 
all of the things from the letter, um, which just now we spent a lot of time talking about the third item a lot. Um, I just want to just take us through and say that um, I think I can get us through the second one pretty quickly. The second suggestion from CNU and NARP was adopt design standards for additional residential units. Um, based on this discussion, I think that we're feeling like we don't need to expand uh, design standards right now. That was part of our discussion about the density thing at the beginning of this conversation. Um, but I just want to stop and pause there and say, is there anything about that second suggestion from CNU that we do want to elaborate more on other than what I have now is only question is whether we should expand the district for us. Um, and I also added a note that it may be preferable for us to uh, monitor how these changes go before considering expanding. Um, is there anything else uh, for the from that suggestion that that people want to bring up before we move on from that? Okay, and then the third suggestion was clarify processes for incrementally adding residential units. That a lot of our conversation just now um, is about that section. So I want to open that one up and say, look, what are, what are we thinking right now about? what we want to do in response to that suggestion. Do we want to do we want to propose any change about I, I gave I feel like I feel like you had some ideas. Well, I I think you know I think the you know if we're good I mean it, we you know my, Mike seems okay with going you know the same way we went from one to two like going from one to four with a permit. I mean you know we're not going to go all the way to where they say where we're not going to have a permit, but you know going from one to four with a permit that seems like pretty reasonable. And. Mike, what are our permit fees? Like if you wanted to get a permit for a four unit building? I mean, I have to look them up specifically. It depends also on whether you're just doing constructing or just doing renovations. So the zoning, just the zoning permit probably isn't too ex isn't too expensive the the fees add up as you start going into drc drc would add i think a hundred dollars to the permit application and drb adds another 100 or 150 dollars i can't remember we just changed the the rules so i don't know them off the top of my head but um is there yeah i don't have i'm trying to think if i've got the, the fee chart right in front of me but it might be there might be in there a hundred dollars per per unit or something like that, or a two hundred dollars per unit. I don't know if Gabe, you remember, but, but any, there's, but the fees overall, the fees are not going to be a huge impediment. So, can I bring up another area? And some of this, Mike, maybe there's just you, you need to discuss this a little bit. We had a conversation, you know, about a month ago about the ADUs. So they had this suggestion in there, uh, which just really is can't be applied because they took issue with the state law. The state law is that, uh, you know, the, the ADU has to be distinct from. Maria asked a question. I, I will just say this, this kind of led me down a little bit of a rabbit hole um, because she's lived in an ADU where, you know, like Mike, you described the distinct from, meaning there were separate entrances. You know, there's I couldn't find anywhere where that's defined. The law is pretty new. It's like 2020. Maybe it hasn't been to court yet. I don't see why an ADU distinct from. I mean, I don't see why, you know, that certainly one unit's gonna have a separate entrance, but I don't know that they couldn't walk through a common area to get to that other entrance. I don't see that legally defined anywhere. Yeah, but they, it, they, but, they could go through a common area. You could go through a common area, but you you have to have your own. In general, if it's going to be uh, rented out, it's got to be a, a, it's got to have its own door in and out. Yeah, so it kind of got me into this other other sort of thinking, and I was trying to understand. Well, what about you know, like this discussion 
of these old dormitories, you know, could you have something where there's some kind of, you know, collaborative housing? I mean, we have all over the city, we've got three or four people that are not related. They're going to rent out a room. They're going to split rent. Well, technically, that's something that we call, uh, what do we call it? There's congregate Congre living. We, we call it con congregate living is what we call it, congregate living. And so congregate living, the idea is that it's not a family group, right, that people are uh, coming in. Well, there are, com there are commercial companies that do this all across the country. I didn't know that until I, Maria asked the question. I started tr trying to figure out what this is about. And, and there, could, there is a model for saying, hey, you can rent rooms. You could rent, we could take, we don't even have to carve up the house on Bailey Street. We can just rent six bedrooms, right? And they can all share a space. But the current you know, rule for that is it's limited by floor area ratio and parking. And I think as we look at this, we should also look at those requirements and say, is that really relevant? Do we really care if they're renting, you know, five bedrooms in, uh, in, on a house on Bailey Street, right? Do we care about that? They have access to parking. If they're riding a bike and that's what they want and that's good for them, like we should be great with that, <laughs> I would think, right? So I don't know. Those are just some things, Maria, you, you kind of got me stirred up trying to figure this thing out. And I went down a rabbit hole, but it just seems like, well, that's another space where we could make a difference. Not necessarily about changing the ADUs, but related to that. What about congregate living? Yeah, and we and we can take a, a more of a look at the congregate living. So for everyone who's who's trying to figure out the, the difference. So an ADU or for a dwelling unit, there are five requirements for a dwelling unit. Um, you know, you've got, you have to have a kitchen, you got to have a bathroom, you got to have living, and there's two others. So you got to have these five requirements. If you share any of those five requirements, then you're congregate living. So if you, it, you know, you might have exclusive right to your bedroom, um, and your bedroom may have a private bathroom. Um, and you'll see some of these with, um, you know, senior housing units, um, you know, a certain level of senior housing. You might have your own living space, which might have its own um, bathroom, but you've got a cafeteria for the kitchen. Well, that's a congregate living situation because you're sharing one of the requirements, one of the the, the five requirements are being shared among all the members. That's the, that's the main difference between having congregate living and having uh, a dwelling unit. Um, and it's just when it comes to the ADUs, you're talking about having a dwelling unit where it has all the five requirements. And then, um, you know, it can connect to the other house, but it has to have, if it's going to be an ADU, it has to have its own exit or have its own distinct entrance. Um, so that way you're not in any way, you have freedom of movement, basically. Um and so if you had to walk through somebody else's kitchen and dining room to get to the exit every day, you probably don't have freedom of movement to always walk in and out and through the house. Um, and your, your property is not considered safe, or at least certainly one of the units is not considered safe because somebody has the right to, to access that unit. So usually you want to have, usually you have to have, uh, a distinct entrance for an ADU. Now, if your ADU is being rented by uh, your mother-in-law or your father-in-law, and it's a true old, old-fashioned accessory dwelling unit for a sick parent, um, then yeah, you're obviously going to have a door that connects through to yours, and they have their own space to live, but it connects through. But uh, if it's going to be rented, it's got to have its own entrance to the outside, so you've got freedom of movement. Mike, are there any requirements for congregate living settings? Uh, it's based on, so because density can't apply, it is based on floor area ratio. So what is floor area ratio? That's usually what's used for commercial. So if you were to look at the density charts in the zoning, um, I've got the zoning here. So this is residential 9,000. The residential density is one dwelling unit per 9,000. Non-residential is a 0.5 FAR. So 9,000 square foot lot, you're at 0.5. You'd multiply 0.5 times the size of your lot. Let's say it's the minimum lot of 9,000 square feet. You could have 4,500 square feet of congregate living space. 
that you can then split up into however many number of units you want. Now that that's not the footprint of the building because it could have multiple stories, um, but that's you're measuring based on the amount of square footage of of um, of the of the building as opposed to counting the number of individual dwelling units. And so that would be really the the bigger difference. Um, so really, it's, it's it's kind of almost a truer density requirement. I mean, if you actually went, if we went to all FAR, we would not have to worry about counting the number of dwelling units, which is exactly what we want to do. So actually, applying it to residential development wouldn't would almost accomplish the same thing. I guess I didn't understand that when I was reading it. So you're saying. So it's limiting the amount of living space on side of that inside of that 9,000 square foot unit. But how many, if they had, you know, it doesn't matter how many bedrooms they had inside of there, as long as they've got the definition of congregate living, obviously it's got to, you know, they got to have bathrooms and kitchens and stuff like that. But yeah, it still has to have all that, five units. You still have to have shower showers and, and bathrooms and kitchens and everything, but at least one of those is going to be shared. And it may be, as you said, a dormitory is a perfect example of, a congregate living. You've got a key to get into your own room. Uh, you go down the hall, you've got shared bathrooms, shared shower facilities, and you've got a cafeteria. Um, that's that's a classic congregate living situation, but you also have rooming in boarding homes and rooming in boarding houses that um, show up from time to time where somebody may rent a room. Um, there was co-housing was a popular thing, you know, it's still still around now, but you know where you might have everybody has their own little house, but there's you know shared, um, shared maybe shared kitchen facilities. Um, so it's it's just a different option that gives people a little bit more flexibility. But yeah, I mean a, sh a shift to FAR wouldn't actually be a bad thing if we could get out of the density requirement and just the density is FAR, then you could say. This neighborhood. <clears throat> so, for example, the residential nine thousand. Where's resident? We had been talking about residential six thousand. Let me just flip the page. FAR is the same. It's 0.5. So, um, we've been talking a lot about the that the neighborhood, Brian's neighborhood there, Res six thousand. We could just do a 0.5 FAR and look at how big his house is and you know, or how big the property is. And if he's got, uh, you know, a, a 10,000 square foot property, he would have 5,000 square feet worth of living space that he could subdivide into however many number of residential units he wants. And the limit is the, the FAR, the floor area ratio. It's usually used in commercial zoning most commercial so what, what about the parking requirements is that something that we could lift you know particularly in certain zoning districts like in the downtown area or, or does that well, not apply anyway yeah. because it's commercial yeah that's that's john's favorite one he's he's pushed for for a long time um and we've tried we've so we don't have parking requirements in urban center one two and three so again our urban downtown doesn't have residential densities it doesn't have parking requirements and the world has not ended. Um, we also have managed to expand no parking requirements to Res 1500. So St. Paul Street, uh, you know, kind of over there by School Street. There's a little section in there. There are a couple of other places, but there are no uh, parking requirements in that district as well. Um, but as you go out, when we did the zoning change in 2018, the big thing we did was to really make those numbers very, very low. So we went all the way down to one dwelling, just one, one dwelling unit, one parking space per dwelling unit. And then we also made the rules more flexible. So you can have blocked in parking. So if you have a driveway that's 60 feet long, that's three parking spaces. You just stack the cars and whoever has to get out first, better be the person who's parked at the end, or you've got to work with your, you know, if it's a triplex, you'd have to just work with your other people in your building to make sure people are parked in the correct order. That's, that's the problem of the landlord. That's the problem of the tenants. That's not the problem of the city um, because we can count parking spaces really easily. So we have really made it very easy to meet that requirement um, by, by making the requirement really low 
and then making it maximizing the opportunity to meet it. So especially if you've got a garage in the back, then you might have two car garage. That's two parking spaces plus the two in front plus two more. You could fit six parking spaces really easy. Um, the person parked in the garage is going to have a hard time getting out, but that's not my problem. But you met the parking requirement. The parking space doesn't need to belong or be used by the person living in the unit either. That would be my goal in the future. I mean, it would be nice to have parking as a separate uh, accommodation because, you know, as as John is well aware, it's a very famous um, there's a very famous book on parking that talks about that. The, even if you ride a bike, when you rent your apartment, you're still paying for the parking space. And if we could decouple renting parking spaces from the rent of the dwelling unit, then you know you would go in and maybe pay a thousand dollars a month to rent your apartment. And if you want a parking space, then it's an extra two hundred bucks, and it's an extra two hundred bucks for every parking space. Um, then, if you're riding a bike, you're not you're not paying the twelve hundred bucks. You know, you're not paying the extra 200 for the parking space you're not using because you are paying for that parking space, whether you use it or not. And that's what the the theory is trying to get communities to get to. It's really hard to get there. Um, but that that's the vision in the end is if you can decouple them, then there will be a market for parking spaces. And then we just have to be able to allow people to sell parking spaces as a parking lot. Um, and I have a, fr a friend in my opinion who is complaining because um, he has a car and, and parking space in his unit is rented to someone else. I said, well, why don't you, you rent the parking space or get in? And he says, well, it's so much cheaper to, not to do that. And I can just keep my car. I don't really need my car in, until the weekend. And I just keep it at a friend's place. Uh, and and it's like it's like this is exactly what we want, or it's like this is like the market. This is how people figure things out. But... So yeah, d definitely in the state, the state is looking at trying to limit parking. I mean, the state, um, what the state is proposing right now in their draft housing bill is to get every community to one parking space per dwelling unit, and that you can't go more than that. Whether that passed is whether I think that's a good idea for every community. I don't know. I'll leave that up to the legislature. But basically, the state is trying to get to where we are. So we're already doing a good job with our numbers. Um, would it be good to get less than what we've got or get to get to no parking requirement? That would certainly be a, a good place to start looking to get to. But again, it's kind of like removing the density requirement. It takes a lot of political capital to convince people they don't want that requirement. And like, I think Maria's point about the density, like, is it going to create, how big of a difference is it going to make? Probably not a huge one, but maybe a few might get like a few units out of it. That's right. I keep going back to, well, the AARP, the purpose of their letter was that they want more accessible housing in Montpelier. That's like their goal. Um, and then as we go through these bullet points, it seems like, Mike, you're saying like a lot of this is already in place. And so, well, then how do we create more housing? Like how do we help manifest <laughs> more housing in the accessible parts of Montpelier? You know, if these things aren't what's going to do it because it's maybe already in place and it was done even 20 years ago, like what, what, what can we do, you know? Um, and I guess doubling the density, like you said, I think would have that effect. You know, I don't know how political, politically feasible it'll be, but if these suggestions are kind of off the mark, what, are, what can we do? That would have that the effect that AARP and I think a lot of people in Montpelier, Montpelier are looking for. So I think the the hard the the hard part is it's you know oh, people don't want our, the character of our area to change. We are pretty built out, so a lot of it is trying to work with what's there. There are no, there are a couple of vacant lots that are here there are a couple of vacant buildings that could be either demolished 
or rehabbed. Um, so we don't have a lot of potential to be able to go in like other communities could go in and say, oh, we're going to put in 400 housing units. Well, we just, I mean, unless we're talking about Country Club Road, Sabin's Pasture, or Crestview, um, we just don't have parcels that are big on sewer and water ready to go. So a lot of our stuff is a lot of incremental stuff. And so we kind of got through our first hurdle. It can't happen unless until it's allowed under the zoning. I think for the, and in a lot of cases, we have gotten over that hurdle. It's now allowed. There's not an economic push for some people to go through that next step. I can have an accessory unit or I can have a duplex, but I'm happy with my property and I don't want to deal with a, a landlord. That's one piece. And that's going to change over time as people sell their houses. New people are going to come in and say, you know what? I've just spent a lot of money to buy this place. You know, it would do me a lot of good to put in an accessory apartment to help cover the the mortgage because, you know, the people living there bought the house, you know, in, in 1995 for 120000 they're selling it for 650,000. The person buying it for 650,000 is like, I got a mortgage and I'm going to need a little bit of help. And the accessory apartment is going to make that difference for me. So that'll be that, that takes time to get through that change. Uh, I think the other piece now is economic and that's where we're looking at trying to build out more housing programs. Um, and that's what Josh in my office is trying to work with the housing committee on. How can we help people? Because when we came out with a proposal that said, if you want to put an extra dwelling unit in your house or in a garage or on your property, we will give you up to $20,000 to help you do that. And we had 55 people who came in and said they wanted to put an ADU in. And we had enough money for six people. Mm -hmm. um, so the interest, when we went, just by saying we, we would give you $20,000, some of it a grant, some of it a loan, uh, it was a pilot program. The interest is there to to put more units in, but it costs on average, and this was what we learned in the pilot program, between eighty and a hundred thousand dollars to put in an ADU. And a lot of people, they boy, they start to pause when they start seeing those types of numbers. Um, you know, th this is my retirement. I'm going to take out equity in my house and put a hundred thousand dollars in, and maybe it doesn't work out. Maybe my tenant doesn't pay me, you know, maybe, what, what do I do now? I've got to go and evict somebody who's not paying. It's not worth the risk. I'll just sit on, sit on this. And so that's where I think we're at now is trying to come up with programs that help people help them get over the financial piece. Cause it's now not regulations that are getting in the way. There's still some, you know, as we pointed out, you know, maybe somebody has got a duplex wants to go to a triplex and just can't, they don't have their properties, not three times the size. Um, and this will help some of them. And I think I think that's where we're at. And then the big projects are going to come with things like Country Club Road and a handful of a, a number of larger parcels. The Northfield Street proposal is out there. There's actually two on Northfield Street, one that's Habitat for Humanity and the Boves project. Those are larger housing projects. We just got to get a few of these big ones to start moving and getting over the finish line. Um, and that's where we're going to get big housing numbers. But the infill, unless you're going to bulldoze residential neighborhoods, and that's what everybody's worried about, we're not going to get big changes in numbers um, in in the in the neighborhoods that surround the downtown. Maybe we'll get some of our downtown buildings that used to be commercial office. Um, office, that market softened a lot. There's a lot of office space that's available and a number of property owners in there are, are looking at converting some of those office spaces to residential. So that's another area we might see see some. We need more more builders. Maybe if we have a maximum allowable density of attorneys and planners and replace it with a minimum density of builders in the city, <laughs> we'll get somewhere. Um, no, okay. no offense to all every everyone on this on this uh, call. Here. Hey, as as you said before, we could all become developers. And I've actually considered it myself at times. But hey, we're running out of time, so I want to bring things back a bit. I'll also say, Maria, to get um, as a reading suggestion, the housing chapter, which we've mostly finalized, um, is going to be. Um, it should be our 
best ideas for what to do about housing in the next eight years. So you can check that out too for like what we hope we'll, that we can do. Um, I also would say to, to respond to your question, like we should constantly keep asking that and we should constantly be working on every idea we have um, for that. Because I, I think this is like a death by a thousand cuts type situation not a like a silver bullet thing okay so uh before we run out of time i want to make sure we have concrete things down if we if we want to propose more concrete things for cnu suggestion number three i have one response that we have for incrementally adding residential units is to um change the zoning so that we allow four units on each conforming building lot in the city First question, does that capture what we discussed? Is that your guess, understanding, Mike? I guess I would just say that that's that's an uh, that's one of the options. Um I I you know, um if we're you know, if we were putting a couple of them on the table, we could have we could remove the density altogether, we could double the density or we could make triplexes and quadplexes um so, so i would so look at those as this, three yeah, three this, options so, on a spectrum and go through and say we could do one of these three i don't think we would do two two of three or three of three i think we would pick one of those three to be the thing we want to go for so, so eff effectively let's let's say we did this because i just heard like like gabe was interested i heard a lot of discussion about it that's why i put that one down let's say we, we went with that um, obviously would apply to the places outside of the design review district where density's already gone. Um, so it would be it would be an every place thing. Um, okay, bye, John. Um, and I don't know if Gabe's unavailable his camera's off, but I don't know. It, it, are people are people interested I, in? I just have to make whatever. some dinner. Sorry. <laughs> It's it's all right. It's all right. What I'm asking is because I'm trying to get us to have some concrete down, concrete things down before we go. Um, it, uh, Gabe, were you out of all the things discussed for suggestion number three from CNU, allowing four units on each conforming building lot in the city? Is that one of the ones you thought was the most attractive? Is that something that we that you think we should put down as a concrete? Thing yeah, I, I mean, I, I actually agree with what Mike said. I mean, let's put all three of those things down there and let's have a conversation about it. I think to go in a four in terms of uh, the kind of, re you're always going to have people that show up, but that seems way more palatable. And frankly, it's the legisl I don't think the legislators legislature is going that far, but they're having this conversation right now, right? So we're, it's not like we're out of step with where everybody else is at. Um, I, and I, just for the record, I think if the state catches us on some of these things, it means that we're now doing the legal bare minimum and we're no longer really any kind of model or, you know, we're not, we're not any kind of gold standards for sure. Um, so anyways, so, so I'm going to have that down for now. What were the other things like, just because a lot of stuff was floating around, what else should we put down? Um, I heard Mike, you said about eliminating the density caps. What was the other thing you mentioned? Uh, well, I was just saying the three of those that were on the spectrum spectrum were no eliminating density, which we've talked about. Um, and there may be other design things that have to go in with that, but if we could eliminate the density, we could double the density. Um, okay. or we could just go through and say everything up to four units are are permitted uses okay. as well, regardless of density. And I think that's a, a one, two, or a three. We would pick which one of those we think either politically is the most palatable. We'll have the well, biggest bang I, for the buck or whatever. We would make a decision on which th which one. Okay. I, I think it would be okay to, to to suggest more than one because again, if if we say if we say remove density, we're saying that in a finite area. So we're not doing anything to the rest of the city to create housing. And and this letter is about creating housing everywhere. I mean, the letter was not that restrictive. Um so I think that those two match together. True, true. If you There's, said if you said the A is just for the des just for the design review, and then one, then either B or C would be for the rest of the town. Then I I see where you're going with that. Yeah. Um, okay. Yeah, and I th okay. Was there anything else in that last section? I mean, was there ADU? Did we land anywhere with? 
do we feel like we need to, to look into ADUs e e anymore? Um, yeah, many, I, kind of disagreed with, with those... I disagreed with most of what they were talking about in number three, and I think we've gone through that, kind of beat those yeah. up enough. I, I think our ADUs are okay. I think their complaints were off the mark. So I'm just thinking alternatives. It's like, it's like no, not that, but maybe this other thing with the ADUs or yeah. um, do we... So so far out of the entire our entire response to the letter then would would so far what it what it looks like we're going to recommend back is to remove the caps in this one central area the design review overlay district and then to change um, what's allowed for a building lot of permitted use up to four units everywhere else because it would be redundant with the first thing in the first in the in the design review area. Is there anything else we want to put down as our response right now? Is that good? Seems like those were our big two big policy suggestions coming out of our discussion. Okay. Um, the shared drive, I created a new folder for uh, this topic, the, the CNU letter response. So um, as I was saying before, everyone else should get in there and just review and see how you feel about that. Um, and we'll pick that back up in a month. Uh, so we're nearing the end. Um, does anybody have anything else? We, we might have time to squeeze in the minutes. Did we um, want to check with uh, Stan? He's jumped on, see if he had, he wasn't here for the about, yeah. Yeah, I noticed Stan a while ago. Um, so uh, yeah, we have a member of the public, um, Stan Brinkerhoff. This, uh, this is your chance if there's anything you'd like to raise that's either um, on the agenda or not. Um, just let us know, Stan, if you uh, want to say I, anything to us. No, thank, thank you so much. I'm uh, a member of the City Housing Committee and, and just present. OK, great. Well, welcome. Thank you. Um, and yeah, we're definitely welcome any communication from the housing committee. Uh, yeah, because as Maria said earlier, like, how can we fix housing? Well, it's like, yeah, a lot of things, a lot of things. And we're not the same, only ones working. Yeah, same, same question we have. So it's, it's interesting to hear uh, some of your thoughts, uh, but we're simply just joining. Oh, did we just lose Kirby? Yeah, we lost Kirby, so I don't know what to do. <laughs> All right, that means I'm in charge. So if we have a motion to adjourn, do, do we need to uh, look at the minutes? Do we have, did anybody, anybody uh, want to make a got motion a quick, on the minutes? If somebody's got a quick motion, otherwise we will have four of them for the next meeting. And then I'll hold your feet to the fire and put it first on the agenda. Or I'll take a motion to adjourn. So moved. Second. Ariane, Ariane, raise her hand. That's great. Okay, we'll see you guys in a month. Thanks, everyone. Yep. See you on the 13th. Thanks, everybody.